Good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? Everybody thankful? Amen. All right, you're going to get an opportunity to share what you're thankful for here shortly. Amen. All right. So uh, once again, uh, a little over a week ago, we went out with our street, street ministry. And uh, each day is, is different, to say the least. Um, we're truly blessed. We, we were able to have a couple uh, new people join us on our, on our street ministry, and uh, hopefully that'll continue to grow as well, and uh, maybe they'll even return. Who knows? Um, but I'd like to start off with uh, if Donita is willing to share something that she's got, and she usually gets here on early on Saturday morning and even starts cook the cooking process on Friday a lot of times for the meal that we share. And uh, invariably, one challenge or another seems to creep up on us. So I'd uh, just like to uh, have her share her pers perspective, and, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, well, first off, I just want to say that um, now I haven't counted this personally yet, but this is what I read that um, there are over or about 2,000 Bible verses about helping the poor. Um, I did not realize that. Uh, so doing what I'm doing makes this even more um, special to me to, to know that I'm, I'm helping doing what God wants us to do. Um, so when I first started cooking for straight canes, it was because they needed just someone to cook for them, just someone to help. And that was uh, in September of 2022. And the first time I cooked, they fed over 120 people or about that. And I was amazed about how many people I didn't realize that that was so many people that needed to be helped. Um, so it kind of became like a challenge for me, like every time I cook, like, okay, let's see how much more we can do next time, you know, and um, so I thought the more we fed, we were really doing good and, and God would be pleased. As I started to grow in Christ, I realized it wasn't just about feeding our neighbors food, but it was also about feeding them the word of God. In Hebrews 13, verse 16, it say, states, but to do good and to communicate or let me rephrase that, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. I did not understand or would look away when I would see someone with a sign asking for any kind of help. And also in Proverbs 14, verse 31, he that oppresseth the poor repro reproacheth his maker, but he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. <clears throat> Even Jesus didn't want to send people away when um, he was t teaching them his word. He fed them also. So I realized during my cooking that God has given me a gift of making a feast. Because I can't cook just for little. I Even at home, like, I cook for an army. <laughs> I don't know how. I just... It's just not in me. I, I have so much food left over when we're done. But, um, and it states in Luke chapter 14, verse 13, but when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. During this, I have realized, um, like I said, God gave me a gift to cook a feast. Um, I've combined stuff that I would not have thought of even combining for my family, and it tastes good. Um, Jesus is teaching me prayer works. I have seen prayers answered not only with our neighbors, but within Street Kings. I started using the time I'm cooking in the morning before anyone gets there as my time with God. One morning, God said, pray over the boxes of food that goes out, so I did. At first, I hesitated because I was alone, and I thought, oh, my gosh, if someone walks in here and I'm sitting here praying, whoops, sorry, I'm sitting here praying over boxes because just to me that was like, what is she doing? 
you know. So um, that day that I did pray over the boxes, they had a good day that day. But the, um, the next time they went out, I didn't take the time to do it, to pray over the boxes. I, it just, I got too distracted and too busy, and the enemy found some cracks to get in there. So obedience is one of the things that I'm being taught along with power of prayer. Serving others is selfless love, and God is love. Street Kings is changing me by loving others in the places that they are in at that moment and letting them see Jesus that's in me. When Jody and Barb, when Jody and Barb tell me our neighbors say thank you so much, I was so hungry, this was the answer to my prayers, or I haven't ate in a week or two, I thank God for working through us to answer their prayers. When prayers are answered, it strengthens belief and faith, and I feel what Street Kings is doing not only increases our faith, but it increases our neighbor's faith, which in turn increase in, increases God's kingdom. The actor, I don't know, um, Robin Williams, during his career, he asked every production company to hire at least 10 homeless people every time he had a movie. And in his lifetime of his career, he helped 1,520 homeless people. So in the end, I just, through all this, I have learned three major things. And the first one was I felt sympathy for our neighbors, which means feelings of pity and sorrow, sorrow for someone's misfortune. The next thing, he taught me empathy which is the ability to understand and share those feelings of someone else. And then there's compassion, which is to suffer together and feel motivated to relieve their suffering. And then last night I saw, or I should say this morning, Mike comes home from all night doing snow removal. And he says to me, I'm so hungry. I said, why, didn't you not eat? No, when I was out moving, re moving snow, I saw a homeless man, and I gave him my whole entire food. Thank you, Jesus. So let's see what Barbie has to share. You want me to hold the mic for you? Sure. Okay, I want to read um, John thirteen thirty four, A new commandment I give you that you love one another like I've loved you, and also love one. And then, one more. I'm not used to talking to big people, just little kids. <laughs> okay, uh, Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he has loved another has fulfilled the law. I believe it's God's law that we love one another. Um, I was fortunate, and fortunate enough that George asked me and Charlie, by the way, he was up all night too plowing, so he's getting some rest. Um, that George invited us to come and do the our neighbors. I had no idea what it looked like, but I knew it meant so much to me because our neighbors, they're just like anybody else. I mean, how many of us, if we lost our job, we lost our house and our car, where would we be? And we would want somebody to help us. God loves us all, matter what. Another reason I love our neighbors is because I believe that everybody has some type of addiction. Granted, it's probably not alcohol or drugs or anything like that, but it could be food, it could be pornography, anything. So I believe that we all need to get on our knees and thank God for what we have. Okay, this is the hard part. Um, our son we lost two and a half years ago. He was only 34. He was a meth user. 
for many years. In 2018, Bobby was clean for two years. He had a job, he had an apartment, he had a car. He was doing wonderful. Then COVID hit. He lost his job. He lost his apartment. He lost everything. So he knew nothing else. He thought he didn't have any hope. So he went back to the streets. But God took good care of him. At the end, he was in ICU. And Charlie and I were sitting on the either side of him. And the doctor said once they took him off the ventilator, that would be it. He would be gone. And so I kept praying, God, I've got to talk to him. I've got to know where he's going. My son woke up, and he looked at me, and he said, Mom, I'm not gone. So I'm sitting there crying. And I said, Bobby, do you know where you're going when your life is ended? He said, Mom, I don't deserve anything. I've done so much to my body. I've hurt people. I'm just a terrible person. And I said, no, you're not. You are a wonderful person, and God loves you no matter what happens. All you got to do is ask God to forgive you and ask him back into your heart, and you will have eternity. Well, he sat there, and we prayed, and that day he did ask Jesus into his heart and to forgive him for everything he had done wrong. Uh, God had a purpose for me because I believe that other people need to hear my story about my son and the walk we went through with him. And I know I'll see him another day. At the end, we'll both be united. So matter what, if we love our neighbors, our family, whatever, God loves us all, so he gives us the commandment to love everyone. Thank you, Barbie. Sure. I don't want it. <laughs> All right. Let's see what these two youngsters have to say. For me, it was just very educational being able to see the differences as far as um, where the homeless people are at in comparison to the city. Um, just witnessing the different places that he went to and um, his interaction with them and um, how they move as a team and so on and so forth. We were very um, blessed and favored to be there, especially to have my whole family there, even my daughter and the one in there, um, there. So I was very grateful to be out there. Um, on a personal note though, you know, as you go through life, certain things die on the inside of you and when you're out there, um, God can use your experiences um, as far as what it is that you're witnessing, as far as what it is that you're hearing, um, to bring back to life certain things in you that have died from um, things that you have experienced throughout the course of your life. So it was, it was invigorating. Um, it was reviving. It was refreshing. And um, I'm grateful to have gone with you guys. And when you, Stefan, when you talk the city, you're talking Denver, where you, yeah, where um, you lived in Colorado before? And in Arizona. Um, predominantly, though, in Colorado, we would go out and evangelize. And for the most part, all the homeless people are in the alleys and on the streets, um, like downtown area. Um, they have Tent City, where there's just a huge population of them, and they're all gathered together, or they're in the parks. This is the only place I've ever been where... Um, you just drive up to the woods, you get on the bullhorn, and then they just start coming out of the woods. So it was just very educational. I've never seen that before. Um, it was just very, and then I worked at a certain place um, that was close to some woods that we went to, and I used to go out there for my breaks. And um, right on the back side of where it is that I worked, where I used to go out for my breaks, where it was this whole community of um, homeless people, and I didn't know that they were there, and they were there that whole time. So it was just, just very educational for me. Once, once the tree, uh, tree started shedding yeah. the leaf and the, the foliage went away, 
that you could just see they were just a few hundred feet yeah. from all this business and, and activity and little did people know, you know, it just, you just kind of a sight unseen. Yeah. So that was, we had a little chat about that. It was like, oh, I didn't even know, <laughs> you like, know, yeah. Well, thank you, Stefan. We appreciate that. Um, so I just, I guess I touch and agree with him. Um, it was very educational. Um, the evangelizing that I have more experience with is um, teen moms. Um, so we would go um, to their high schools during their lunch breaks. We would hang out with them, pray with them, just chat with them, um, and evangelize to them. Um, so it was just, it was very interesting just to see. And I'm from where it doesn't snow at all, and it barely rains <laughs> in Arizona. So to see all these people and then to think about, like, how they survive in the winter, like, they're really out here making it. Um, and there was a scripture um, George had asked me when we had first got here in the morning, what's your favorite scripture? Um, and I got back to him a little bit later about it, but it's Philippians 2 and 4. Um, 4 through 11, actually, but I'll just read 4. Um, it says, don't be interested in only your own life, but care about the lives of others too. In your way, oh, in your life together, think the way Jesus Christ thought. Um, so just what I would think about, what how I interpret it and from what I have seen from what Street Kings does, um, like it's amazing. Because <laughs> like, they, they could do anything else with their Saturday, um, even though they only go every other Saturday, but they could be doing so many other things um, that is more in the interest of them, but instead they are out and they are serving God no matter the weather, no matter what type of people that they have interactions with, um, and just the sacrifices that they make. Barb making blankets for people, Donita waking up early with all those kids in her house, <laughs> having to deal with all those kids. Um, and then George just, just you know, carrying big ice coolers like full of food and um, taking the time out of the week to go shopping um, to find things for people. And um, yeah, it was just a very good experience. Um, another scripture that, um, I had shared with one of the girls that we were evangelizing to, she was happy to get a Bible. Um, she hadn't had one, um, so she was very thankful for that. And um, one thing that I saw when she was speaking to us about a situation that she had been through um, was fear. So I think it's Isaiah 41 and 3. Will you pull it up? I don't, I don't have it on my phone. <laughs> I think that's it. Okay. Yeah, yeah and I, I don't know about it in King James. Um, yeah, um, who pursued them and passed them safely by the feet that he had not gone? Oh, wait. Yeah, I can't, I don't know. Anyways, um, but it was just, she was just very fearful. Um, so that scripture, um, I mean, I pray it kind of stuck with her, um, with her knowing that she doesn't need to be fearful, that um, there's a good fearful that she could be, and it's only in the Lord. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you. Thank you, Cece. So, uh, Miss Jody was unable to be here. She worships with uh, in his light ministry, but is a part of a lot of different things um, through New Beginnings as well. And um, one of the one of the areas where we went is down by the uh, Walmart on Southeast Fourteenth Street. There's a a camp out behind it, and then there's usually people milling around and on the over on the the north side by the laundromat as well as out front in that. But um, when she wanted me to share this, this message, and I'll just read it, and it says, and, and towards the end of the day today, the man that was, was so mean to me several weeks ago asked for a Bible, and I could, all I could do was cry as I watched Charlie walk it over to him. I, I can't describe it other than I was filled with overwhelming joy for this man in that moment. 
And that is why we press on and say, not today, Satan. Not today. And I do, I enjoy, I mean, it gets me work at times. Don't, don't get me wrong. But there, there are so many things that do give me joy about this. Um, that's one of them. When we can give somebody a Bible and we know we've done our part. We've done our part, and that word is with them after we leave. They can read that word. They can, even if they give it to their neighbor, I don't care as long as, you know, we've done our part. But we had the opportunity last week, or a couple weeks ago now, to uh, give out, oh gosh, I think eight Bibles, something like that, it's eight or nine different Bibles. And that's... That's why I want to be out there. I want to be able to share the word of God with them. Um, and, and even after I, I, we're not there, whether it's me or whether it's whoever it is. Um, and, I mean, Jody's witness alone, too, is and watching her grow and watching everybody else grow. And, and it's, just, it's just another opportunity for us to, to try to walk it out and try to walk it out with, with our Lord. Um, So I was reminded of something this weekend, and I just want to read this to you if I can. This is a little bit, uh, maybe even a little more in tune for the analytical or uh, uh, those that feel like they got to plan everything out. Um, but it's good for the rest of us as well. It says, I'm a strategic planner by nature and career. It can be a blessing and not so much sometimes. Like when I'm waiting for an answer on God's plan versus my plan. This, then it says, the reading this has really hit me. I realize that I often look for a plan in order to secure my peace. But God doesn't offer us a plan. He has a plan. But we don't get to know that plan. That would re wouldn't require any faith. Do you have faith in God's plan? Or are you securing your peace with your own personal agenda? Whether you turn to the right or whether you turn to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Isaiah 30, 21. Are we betting the voices? Are we, we've been working on that in Bible study, right? Are, are, what voices are we listening to? So in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 and 11, it tells us he has a plan. But then if we go on and read 13 and 14 and 12, or 12 through 14, he'll sh share the rest of the plan. And part of that is, is something that we need to do as well. Um, many scriptures like Donita says, you know, I mean, whether it's our peace or God's peace, you know, it's seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6 and 33. Um, you know, guys, it's just, are we putting ourselves out there, whether it's, whether it's with us on the street, whether it's me with my family, um, blessed again this weekend, all over, I mean, we we shared Thursday with 55 out of 100 and some, you know. Would have loved to have had 100 and some, but at least there was at least there was 55. Um, and then again this weekend, we had the opportunity to spend with our children and our grandchildren, all but two, all but two of the grandchildren, um, to see my wife smile. In my heart, good. My heart, good. So yeah, um, very blessed, and I guess I would like to hear if uh, God is doing anything um, for you, in you, or through you. A lot of y'all, my name is Paul Morrison.
Katrina, my bonus daughter. And uh, mine is rather different, but the young lady right here, I was her son. 18 years old, I went to Vietnam. Before I was 19, I shot the first time. I wound up getting shot three times in Vietnam, decorated war hero. Only thing I bought back from Vietnam was PTSD and a drug habit that for the next 35 years kept me in and out of Fort Madison. I did over 18 years in Fort Madison, Iowa State Penitentiary, all of because of drugs. I thought the Lord had, because of the atrocities that I saw in Vietnam and also the ones I participated in, I thought the Lord had no use for me whatsoever. So I came back with a bad attitude. And as far as I was concerned, the world was crazy. Leave me alone and I'll be all right. Every day, every day of my life, drugs and alcohol. I had a habit while I was in Fort Madison. I was also locked up in Lansing, Kansas and Fort Leavenworth for bank robbery. I was, nobody wanted me. And then- uh, What changed? What changed is 12 years and 10 months ago, I got on my knees. I was in an abandoned house in February. I had cut the carpet to cover me up. When I called a friend of mine, I had a cell phone. I called a friend of mine and said, I need help. He took me to the VA hospital. When I got to the VA hospital, right now I weigh 220 pounds. When I checked into the VA hospital, I weighed 158 pounds with double pneumonia. They had to, I was so weak, they had to weigh me in the bed out there. Both lungs was full of fluid. But before my friend got to the house, I got on my knees and cried like a little baby and said, dear Lord, please help me travel down this road. I'm getting ready to go down. This was a 56 day program at the VA and I told them they were gonna have to get one of them Hennepin tow trucks to get me out of there before I was ready. I wound up staying over six months in this program. And since then, beside the bad attitude and drug habit, every two or three years for some reason I bought some disease back from Vietnam that gives me a septic infection in my body and twice they have told my wife to call the preacher because I wasn't coming home. But as we both say, that's the only doctor up there. There you go. You know, there you go. Uh, he's taking the infection was so bad one time it was getting into my brain and I passed out at the house. My wife had to call the ambulance to get me. <laughs> I like to tell this little story before I tell the rest. I had on some hospital scrubs and house shoes when I passed out. When I woke up with her and Pastor Gaddy, the pastor of St. Paul and the church standing next to me, I said, oh Lord, I'm dying. And that ain't what I said exactly. <laughs> but uh, I looked and I'm in the ICU and I got on a beautiful Nike outfit and tennis shoes. And you know how they ask you, you got any money? And I'm gonna tell you, I usually keep three, $400 in my pocket. I said, yes, I do. And my wife said, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm passed out on the floor, she didn't change my clothes and mug me <laughs> and took my money, you know. And, <laughs> but, uh, the, and then beside that, a year ago this past April, I was diagnosed with aging orange leukemia, you know, blood cancer. But a grown man like me and you, our blood count, white blood count is supposed to be between seven, fourteen thousand. 14,000. Mine was 187,000 when I got to the hospital. And beside that, you know, I've OD'd off drugs, but I'm gonna tell you this, this testimony is not for me. It's for everybody in here who might have someone in their family dealing with drugs or alcohol. Say that. Don't give up on them. Amen. Look, at the, I got a grandson right there, wear the same size shoes. I probably got over 200 pair of shoes. I gave up drugs for shoes, you know. <laughs> And now he thinks he's going to just go to my clothes closet and shop, you know. But uh, don't, don't ever give up on somebody. Because if the Lord can do this for Paul Morrison, 
And God. right, you know what? He can do it for anybody. And I'm just one joint or one beer or anything away from being back in that abandoned house. But every day I pray, and right here is a medallion, it's Narcotics Anonymous. I go to it regularly. Some people can do it with just God. Some can do it with just Narcotics Anonymous. I need both. Amen. I need to be around former addicts that can tell me, that can help me. I need to be in church that people can tell go. me how good God has been to me. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. February. I have cooked, I cook every year for the last 10 years for about 50 men to go up to the Newton Spiritual Camp up there. I've cooked at our church, but February 11th, God willing and his old folks saying, I'm old, I'll be 75 in January. Yes. I ride a big pretty Harley all over the United States. Yes, yes. I've been to Key West, D.C. this year, I'm going from here to Seattle, Washington, all the way down the coastal highway to San Diego, Dallas, and home. And you're taking and Jesus then, with and, you, right? And, and then four years ago, I took up skydiving. And so it's all for the grace of God. So I hope February 11th, 2024, I have 13 years clean. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And uh, nothing in my mouth. Uh, mood altering but food and Amen. that's it that's why I look like I do you know? that's why my shirt's out instead of tucked in. but this gentleman here we talked the last we time did. I was here yes, we did. and we've got so much in common Amen. and you know what they say the Lord watches out over babies and foods you know one category <laughs> I am not in that's the baby one you know? been I'm there on. done it thank you thank you brother thank you Thank you. The Lord spoke to me and he brought it back to me. I usually don't remember. <laughs> Shut up, y'all. He got me. The last time that you were here and we brought all the men up and you stood um, up here, the Lord spoke through me. Now, I did not know your testimony. Have I ever heard that testimony before? And one of the things that you said is you thought that God was through with you. And what did God say to you when you were up here? I'm not through with you yet. My God. That's the power of the God that we serve. So he's not done with you. You're going to do a whole lot more in the name of Jesus. One other, one other thing I say. I, two, I worked at Des Moines Public Schools. You know, they took all the resource officers out. Yes. And they have a program now called Let's Talk, mm -hmm. where we're intervention mediation specialists. Yes. I was one because my pastor felt as if I could help the children. Mm -hmm. And then when I was diagnosed with this leukemia, they wouldn't let me go to work because of my immune system. And then also, like Tuesday night, I go into Polk County. This Tuesday, I do it once a month at least. I go into Polk County Juvenile Center and talk to the kids because I was a star athlete in school. I was in the top three of my class, but I decided I wanted to be a Marine and fight a war. And that's, I had scholarships to college and everything. One thing I did do when I come out of the joint, my last time I went back to school and got my degree. Thank you, brother. Thank you. So I think we have another young lady willing, willing to share. Okay, so um, this past weekend, um, we, me and my siblings, we went to Springfield, Illinois, where my parents live. Um, my dad isn't doing too well, so we all wanted to get together and have a Thanksgiving dinner with him. Um, and <laughs> I don't want him to jump in the, <laughs> anyway, um, so me and all my siblings, 
Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so me, me and all my siblings, we met in Springfield, Illinois. Courtney, grab that. <laughs> okay. Go on. Sorry, guys. My four-year-old. Um, so, anyways, me and all my siblings, we went to Springfield, Illinois, to to try to have a pre-Thanksgiving with my dad. Like I said, he's had some health issues. Um, he hasn't, the doctors say, he hasn't been doing well. Um, so we're there and we all, the, we all stay in the same hotel together. Well, the next day we all go to see our parents and say our goodbyes. So we're all out in the front yard and the kids are kicking the soccer ball around and um, God's telling me, pray for him. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, all these people are around, like all, you know, all the siblings and the kids. And I'm like, so I'm praying because Apostle told me when I start getting nervous, pray against that fear. So I'm standing there and I'm anointing my hands and I'm praying. I'm like, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to walk over there and sit beside him and pray with him. So I start walking towards him and my dad's like, hey, Mel, you want to go in the house? I got something I want to show you. I'm like, thank you, God, you know, so <laughs> my dad, we go in the house, and I sit there, and I'm like, Dad, I just want to pray with you. He was like, okay, you know, um, and so I sit there, and I, you know, I anoint him, and I'm just praying with him, and I'm commanding the cancer out of his body, and I'm, I'm commanding um, a clean report when he goes to the doctor on Monday, and I'm just rebuking anything that's been spoken over his life, and I'm commanding a praise report, and every single um, test result is going to be, you know, a, a good, positive thing. There's no more cancer. There's no more nothing in his body, and I'm just, he's shaking, and he's crying, and um, he was like, well, thanks, Mel. I was like, you know, no problem, and so Thursday, he calls me, and he's like, Mel, you know that thing you did? I was like, prayer? <laughs> you mean? My dad doesn't, we didn't grow up in a Christian or a church family. So I was like, prayer? He was like, yeah. He was like, well, it worked. I was like, well, what do you mean? And he was like, I went to the doctor, and they said the colon cancer is gone. Aww. Yeah. yeah. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. And they said his lungs are at a capacity better than they've ever been. And he was like, I didn't, yes, praise Hallelujah. God. Yes, 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 yes. And he's like, I didn't think that God was real, but now I'm starting to think he is. And there so I call Apostle Thursday, and I'm just bawling, you know, and I'm like, I told her the story. And She's yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, my siblings are like, I just don't understand. You know, this just doesn't make sense. And I was like, guys, God, it makes sense. God has the final say, you know, no matter what. And I shared with Apostle, and, um, you know, I, I was always the sibling that was never invited. I was always kind of the black sheep of the family. I was the one that was kind of the outcast. And I really feel like, you know, God made me that way so whenever it was my time to minister to my siblings i wasn't afraid to be different that's right that's right god did not give you a spirit of fear but a power love and, and a sound mind right amen hallelujah yes. hallelujah yes. good girl awesome awesome there you have it yes power of prayer power of prayer who else mark you got anything you want to share Something you're thankful for? <laughs> Just asking. Just asking. You don't have to. <laughs> oh, there you have it. <laughs> uh, shoot, brother. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Um, I was sitting there wrestling and trying to get ready to come up and I'm sitting there looking at Jamil because I feel like this is for you. Um, I was wrestling. My story of going back to school and was, was hard. Um, I started in 2001 um, going through playing football, doing those things, and then stopped in 2002. And so many doors were slammed in my face because I hadn't been. So many, anytime I get to an opportunity, 
the door will be shut because I had to finish my degree. It took all the way until I started building a relationship with God. And God guided me to it and opening up doors so that I can complete things. I had similar thing in an account on my uh, um, a debt on my account. I, God gave me a job just for a period of time for that job to pay Hallelujah. for me to finish the degree. Yes. So yes. I, I went to that job off the work there just long enough to finish my bachelor's degree. And then um, left there, I'm like, Lord, what am I? Doing, going from faith to faith, career just kind of all over the place. I'm talking to apostles. I remember I'm leaving this one company and they're offering me a severance, and I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm walking around down, downtown Skywalk talking to her for like an hour about what what what's happening. I'm going from one place to the next place with my with my career, and um, I then. I then I then left there and had worked at a, a temporary place for a little while, and um, and then I got an opportunity at this college. I had never I had never even really heard of it. It was just one little moment, I, one little glimpse that I heard of it when um, Enoch Enoch, Enoch transferred from Michael. I don't remember Michael, mm-hmm. but I remember Enoch specifically transferring from there to uh, Grace. And one of my friends that I worked with at Nationwide was like, hey, you should look at this job. I had seen it pop up, and it was a diversity recruiting manager, at, at, and then I had seen it pop up, and I was like, I don't understand no attention. Matter of fact, I had gone into the application, the application process was too complicated, and I was like, I don't want to do it. And I, and I just, I left it alone. So then my friend called. He was like, hey, man, you should take, you should look into this opportunity. He was like, he's like, And so I went ahead and applied. Applied, went through the first round of interviews, and then um, they were telling me how much they were going to offer. I thought, oh, I can't get to that much. I'm going to go ahead and reject. So I withdrew. They called me back and was like, how much do we need to give you uh, to make you interested in this opportunity? I told them how much it was. They said, okay. So I went back and through the uh, candidate pool. And then through the second round of interviews, they ended up offering me that opportunity. And so I'm working in this in the human resources area. Thank you. I'm working in the human resources area. And years ago, I had said, wrote down on a piece of paper, and it's still in my nightstand, that I wanted to be um, a chief diversity officer. And I had been, um, but I thought it was going to be in corporate. I didn't think that it would be in um, higher education because everybody in higher education had PhDs. And even my leader at the time was like, oh, it's impossible for you to, they don't even take people from a HR trajectory into a chief diversity officer. But for whatever reason, God was like, you need to go and get your master." And so I just, I'm like, okay, all right. And so I'm looking up master programs and the University of Dubuque has a unique master program, them and like two other institutions. It was like a brand new master program that they had was a um, master in management for diversity and inclusion leadership. And um, I'm like, well, I can't, they, they were like, we're gonna, in the future, we're gonna be able to offer it online. Cause I'm like, well, I can't commute to the, uh, Dubuque all the time right at that happened, the pandemic hits. And so they, it expedited them to offer the program online. So now I'm the first cohort that takes the, the program completely online. At first he was just like, we're gonna set up a Zoom uh, in the classroom, but then it was like, well, now you're gonna be able to take the, co- the whole thing online because we're gonna have to adapt to the, uh, to the pandemic. So the pandemic, I'm taking, I'm taking the class, I'm doing everything, and Grinnell's paying for the whole thing paying for the whole thing in the master's program. Soon, immediately after the, I complete, almost immediately after I complete my master's program, my, um, my leader, it, my, my leader at the time, who was the chief diversity officer, is getting ready to leave the institution. And, um, goodness, Pella Wendell's recruited me for a chief diversity officer position over there. 
I then get an offer from uh, Pella Wendell's and Grinnell's like, we're gonna retain you. What is it that, you, what is it that you're gonna wanna do? And I said, I wanna be a chief diversity officer. They gave me the interim position there for the year. And then after I was there for a year, they offered me the full-time opportunity. And when I run into people, it's, 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 it's bizarre because I run into folks and they're like, wow, you have a, a interesting trajectory to your position. I challenge you to find somebody else in higher education with my educational background or my career track that's in the same title that I have. And it is so fascinating that God, and, and when I say that education piece is, God may not necessarily tell you what it is for, but he's telling you to do something. Be obedient because he's preparing you to be able to seize the moment when that door he opens it for you. If I wouldn't have went ahead and did that master program when I did it, when the door opened up, I wouldn't have been prepared to walk through. I might have not had my PhD, but I don't believe that no way they wouldn't have let me go in without at least a master degree. And so when he's telling you to do something that he's telling you to do for that education, go ahead. You may not be clear on what it is that you're doing, why you're doing that. And even when I'm talking about this, this CDO position, yes, that's for my, my flesh saying that I wanted that, but God is still illuminating my light in this very secular institution at this same time. I was telling an apostle the other day, I was sitting in the office with, my, um, with one of my friends who is not even a, a believer. And we're sitting there um, talking, and out of nowhere, she's like, She's like, um, are, uh, are, you, are you running from your calling? <laughs> Out of nowhere. She's not, even, she's not a believer. Her grandfather was a, a, um, a pastor. And I said, what? Why, why, would you ask that? why would you ask that question to me? We were talking about faith and things like that, but, but she was like, are you? She was like, oh, my gosh, you're running from your calling. And this is happening, this is happening at Grinnell. Then on another time, I'm speaking in front of the alums. We have multicultural reunion, and I'm speaking in front of the alums, talking to them about some of the work that we're doing in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And, and then another lady, new lady who comes in, she was like, hey, you, you, you know, hey, Bishop. What you, you know, just saying these different things, saying these different things to me. And then this, and then um, an Indian man came up to me afterwards. He was like, oh, I thought you were going to start wiping your, wiping your head off with the, with the towel. But I'm saying all of these different things because even when you aren't, even when you're not functioning in the capacity that, that you're thinking you're sitting in front of a congregation and you're ministering these different things, the light that God has inside of you is going to shine and people are going to notice it and they're going to see it. They're going to see whatever it is. And so I have to, what I'm doing right now is asking God, like, God, why, what was the bigger reason why you put me here? I know that was what I wanted. My flesh wanted me to have that position. But what else reason why do you, do you have me here? Why else do you have me in this season and have me at this moment? So I say you, everything may not be clear. What do you say, um, Apostle? A prophesy in part, know in part? How do you go? The Bible says. Bible size. We prophesy in part, and we know in part. We prophesy in part, and we know in part. Each of us will have a different piece of the puzzle, and when you bring the body together, that's when you get the fullness of what God is trying to release yes. to the body. Amen. Amen. So you may not have all of the pieces together right now, but if God is pulling you to that, go with it with everything that you have Amen. and finish that thing and complete it because at his timing, at his timing, you're going to be like, ooh, wow, just at this right time and that door was open when you completed and you were obedient to what he said. And George... Stay out my business. <laughs> <laughs> brother, I knew, you, I knew you had something. Thank you, brother. I knew you had Oh, it. my goodness. All right. Well, um, I guess we will go, go ahead and wrap this up then. And uh, I think that was a good word for all of us, Mark, not just Jaleel. So thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, I'll pray us out then, and if somebody somebody needs a prayer, and we we thank everybody online and and at home or wherever you're at. So, if you need a church home, New Beginnings is is open. So we just uh, there's multiple ways to get a hold of us. We just ask that you you know reach out to somebody. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, gracious and holy Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. Father God, we thank you for the many different ways that you continue to show us your love, your grace, and your mercy in each one of our lives. Father God, we are thankful. We're grateful, even though uh, some of us may have not gotten up here and spoke today. I know that, that they're grateful as well. So Father God, we just thank you for the children. We know that they're a gift from you, Lord God. Father God, we thank you for the, the baptisms that will go forth this afternoon as well, Lord God. We thank you for uh, Apostle Stephanie being willing to take time of her out of her day uh, repeatedly and teach and to, uh, to do the service as well. So, Father God, we thank you for all that you're doing in her and through her, as well as Pastor Vince and, and O.C. and Kamika and the rest of the leadership team as well. So, Father God, we just thank you for each individual online and in the house. And it's in Jesus' mighty name, mighty name that we pray. Amen.